All right, now in Acts chapter 12, look down at the first verse there. The Bible says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So now we see extreme perse persecution is coming at, at the apostles and at the disciples of Christ, where it's getting to the point now where they're delivering people up to death, to be put to death. James, the brother of John, he was one of the twelve apostles, um, or disciples, he was one of, one of Jesus' twelve disciples, um, one of the top disciples. He was killed with the sword, and it says, and it says in verse 3, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to further take Peter also. So here you have a typical politician, right? Herod, the king, the ruler of this area. He's doing this stuff, not even necessarily of his own will, but just because, hey, he saw that that pleased the Jews. Now, maybe with James, I don't know why he necessarily had a problem with James, but as soon as he kills James, he sees, oh, this is popular. Hey, the people like this. They're cheering. They, they like the fact that I killed James. He's like, now I'm going to go after someone else just to you know, boost, boost his ratings, which is coming. That's what, that's what all politicians do. They, they pander to the votes. They look at the people. They, they want to be popular. right? That's, they, they don't care what the right thing is to do. And that's why we'll never get in this country a godly man that's like in any position of high authority. Because as long as you got the people voting for them, and it's some kind of like democratic voting republic. Unless the people are, are a godly people, just by and large, which America is not, there's no way you're going to have a godly man in authority. Because here's the thing. It's popular, it's a lot more popular in a wicked society to do wicked things, right, than it is righteous things. People are going to hate you and despise you if you do that which is right, even though you know that you're going to be hated for it. And I'll tell you what, that takes a lot of character, it takes a lot of courage, to be able to stand, and, and especially if you're in that position, if you're a manager, if you've got people working for you, you need to be a godly, righteous judge or leader or whatever position you're in, and you need to be able to, to understand and discern, hey, what's right? I'm not necessarily going to make a decision based on what's everybody going to like. I'm going to make the decision based on what's right. And we see here, of course, Herod is, is wicked anyways. He has... He does not do anything that's right. But just because he sees it pleases the Jews, he goes, okay, you know, I'm going to go arrest Peter now too. And just continue with this, with this unwarranted onslaught of the disciples of Christ, of the apostles of Jesus Christ, just to go after them. Now look at verse number three. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in this next section. It says at the end of verse number three, after it says he proceeded further, take Peter also, then were the days of unleavened bread. Now it's always interesting to me when you see parts of the Bible that are just in parentheses, right? Because it's like, why is that added there? What is it, you know, it's not even necessarily spoken. It's just the, it's just the, the author, the writer, you know, just explaining something. And at first glance, you think like, well, that just seems really out of place. But I'm going to show you something that, excuse me, that's just going to, hopefully it's going to blow you away, blew me away. Um, I've heard this before. I know the teaching on this. I studied it out a lot more for, in preparation for the sermon, and it's just completely amazing. Look at verse number four. It says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, I'm, like I said, I'm going to spend a bit of time on this because here, this is the only mention, the only reference of the word Easter in the King James Bible. This is it. And you'll have a lot of the, the anti-King James only people, the people who just, you know, they're okay with any version of the Bible. They'll say this is an error. There's a lot of people saying this is an error in the Bible because it says Easter. And they'll say Easter is a pagan holiday, you know. Um, and they'll just say this is wrong because all the new versions, they'll say the Passover. And, and all the new versions will say something different. You know, they're not going to say it's Easter here. And... First of all, I want to address the issue where there's a lot of people that are saying that Easter is a pagan holiday. And it, it's just simply not true. One of the things that they'll say, one of the arguments they'll say is that, well, you know, Easter is really the celebration or the worship of Ishtar, you know, some, some other god. And basically the only leg that, they, that I was able to see that they have to stand on is just that they sound similar. Easter and Ishtar. Just, they sound alike. But that is a very big flaw when you look up like word etymology. 
You know, you look up where words came from, the root and the derivatives of words. Like a lot of the words in the English language that we speak today are derived from like the Latin language or they're from the Germanic language, right? That's where, where our language kind of came from in a way, you know, its, it's roots are, are tied with, they're real closely related to Latin, the German, that type of thing. So these people are saying, you know, Easter is really just the worship of Ishtar. They have nothing to, to back that up other than it just sounds similar. And if you take words that just sound similar and just, just automatically assume they're related, that's, that's a fallacy in itself. But the other thing is, okay, whatever, whatever paganism you might find associated with people who celebrate Easter, paganism is, is, is crept into just about every aspect of our world and of our society. Okay, just because someone else introduces things that are pagan or whatever, it doesn't make the, the Christian service or the Christian belief or, the, or what the Christians celebrate as wrong. I mean, it's the same way with Christmas. I mean, people say, oh yeah, you're bringing in a Christmas tree into your house, that's pagan, you know, you're worshiping this tree and all this other nonsense. And it's like, no, Christmas has historically been a Christian holiday, as was Easter. Now, here's the thing. The word Easter means resurrection. And if you think about it, you know, this, this actually is legit. Easter... It's, it's referring to the east, right? It's, it's, it is a derivative of east. East is where the sun rises from, right? The sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. Well, it's just as Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, Easter is referring to that event, just as the sun rises in the east. And that's, a deri that's, that's part of what is um, associated with that word Easter. Now, the a big problem where people come up and say that Easter does not belong in this passage Easter is, a, you know, it's, it's, it's incorrect, they should use a different word there, it shouldn't be Easter, is, first of all, they don't understand their Bible history, like where the Bible came from. You know, so, like, the King James Bible is not, it's not a, a hundred percent, was not a hundred percent translated, like, just completely on its own, directly from the Greek and Hebrew. It's really more of a revision. See, there's been a, a whole succession of Bibles Six, six Bibles prior to the King James Version that are kind of in that line of where they followed and, and where people continued to, to work, to build off of the works of the people that, that were before them, right? So like, you know, the, the Tyndale Bible, William Tyndale, he, uh, he translated into English the New Testament and then the first five books of the Old Testament. That's the work that he did. And actually, William Tyndale... Tyndale actually invented the word Passover in English. The word Passover never even existed in the English language until William Tyndale just invented it. And the reason why he invented it is because he needed a word. See, there's a Greek word and a Hebrew word for what we consider the Passover, right? The word that we know today as the Passover. And I'm not going to be able to pronounce it right. It's like Peshka or something, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a word, right? There's a word that when he's translating the Bible, he sees this word and Historically, everyone prior to, to Tyndale, when they had done some kind of English translations, they, were, um, they would just leave it alone or they'd kind of Englishize it, but they didn't, they didn't translate the word. They kind of just, just maintained that same word from the other language and just, and just left it alone, essentially. Now, let's look at what the Passover even is. Go back if you would. Keep your finger in Acts chapter 12 or keep a bookmark there. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 12, because this is where the first time we're, basically, where God's explaining the Passover. And this is going to be important to understand this as we get into this a little bit. Exodus chapter 12, the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter number 12. We start reading verse number 3. I'm going to read through this whole thing because it's, it's going to describe exactly how they're supposed to... Um, perform the Passover, and it gives some indication on why they're doing it. So at Exodus chapter 12, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth, month, tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers. A lamb for a house. So they're saying, okay, the tenth day of the month, you need to go and get a lamb. Okay, and you need, you need to pick one out, and we see in other places, I don't know if it says it here, 
that basically is supposed to be without spot, without blemish. It's supposed to be like a really good lamb. The first thing of the year, you know, it's supposed to be just in great shape, right? It can't have like broken bones. It can't have problems because this is going to be a sacrifice unto God. This is the Passover lamb that's signifying Jesus Christ. I mean, it's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. So they're saying, look, this has to be perfect. And you're going to get it on the 10th day of the month. Now look at verse number four. It says, and if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So he's saying, okay, look, if you got a small household, you know, and one lamb is just way too big, it's just going to produce like, you know, it's way too much food to eat because this is a sacrifice they're going to make and they're going to consume it. Then they're like, okay, you could, you could pair up with like another house and you guys can do one lamb for both of your houses, right? That's all that's saying. Verse number five, it says, here it says, it says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, I'm not going to go into all the symbolism here. There's quite a bit. But okay, we see here on the fourteenth day is when they actually perform the sacrifice of the lamb. That's when they kill it. Verse number seven. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. He's been very specific on how they're supposed to do this. You killed on the 14th day, you know, you need, to, you need to eat it that night, and don't, you know, you can't prepare it any other way than roast with fire. Again, a symbolism of Jesus Christ taking our sins when he died on the cross, his, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world and, and suffered and burned in hell to pay for our sins. This is symbol, symbolic of that. Look at verse number 10. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. So say, whatever you can eat, whatever you don't finish, don't let it remain. Just burn all the remains and just burn it with fire until it's gone. Verse number 11, and thus shall you eat it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So here we see the exact definition of the Passover and why he even chose that word Passover is literally just because the event that happened is this was the last plague in Egypt where God smote, he killed the firstborn sons of everybody in Egypt, anybody that didn't have the blood, the blood of the lamb on their doorposts of their house, all of the firstborn sons died in Egypt. And what he's saying here is that, look, if you have the blood on your doorposts, I'm going to pass over you. I'm not going to kill your firstborn. You're going to be safe. You're going to be covered by the blood. And so much symbolism, i gotta, I got to force myself not to get into it too much. <laughs> um, verse number 14 says, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the generation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. So here we see the 14th day. 
They kill the lamb. That's the Passover day where they kill a lamb and, and eat, you know, eat, eat it at that night. And then whatever remains, they burn until the morning. And then for seven days, from the 15th until the 21st, inclusive, that seven days, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, right? Seven days, they eat unleavened bread. That's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And these two events, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, are tied together. They, they, they happen consecutively. And this is going to be important. Just a second. Now, back to, go flip it forward back to Acts chapter 12. No English translation of the Bible ever used the word Passover until Tyndale created it. And we saw, why did he create it? Because God passed over the houses of Israel that had the blood on the doorpost. It makes sense. It's a great word. I mean, it, it describes exactly that event that, that they're supposed to be celebrating. They're celebrating the fact that God passed over them. Right? So we call it the Passover. Great word to use. Now, his translation was also the first one, basically, to use the word Easter. Okay? Now, what he did, he did the New Testament first. He did the translation of the New Testament first, and he used the word Easter. And from what I understand, what I read in history, again, this, isn't, this part isn't coming directly from the Bible. This is coming from the word of man, take it for what it is. But from what I've read and from what I understand and what I study and what makes sense to me is that Easter has historically been a Christian holiday. And you can look it up in the old Webster's Dictionaries, the old Oxford Dictionary, you know, like, you can look it up if there's all kinds of different references. It's pretty boring, I'm not going to go into all that right now. But basically, it's not even that hard to, to believe that Easter has always been celebrated as a Christian holiday. And the reason why he used that word Easter is because everybody recognized that Easter was a time where they celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it was a Christian holiday. So he used that word because it's, it's the same exact time. It takes place during the same exact time as the Passover lamb did on the 14th day because that's exactly when Jesus Christ was killed. On the 14th day at even is when Jesus Christ was killed on the cross. And, of course, three days later he rose again from the dead, but... but he completely fulfilled that prophecy of the Passover lamb. So what changes after the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that it's no longer the celebration and, and the Old Testament um, you know, laws of, of, of following the Passover and the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now it's turned into, because he, did, he fulfilled it at the exact same time frame, he became the Passover. We celebrate Christ the Passover, and that's what we celebrate at Easter, is the resurrection of Christ, right? I mean, and that's what we celebrate today, and that's what Christians have always celebrated. So what he did, what Tyndale did, was in the New Testament, he used the word Easter, because it's referring to Jesus Christ's resurrection. But what he did in the Old Testament, he realized, he said, I can't use this word Easter. People didn't celebrate Easter in the Old Testament, because Easter is celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's why he came up with that word Passover. So all throughout the Old Testament that he, you know, in the first five books that he translated, he used the word Passover, but in the New Testament he used the word Easter. Okay, so that's, that's first of all. Now, understanding this history of the Bible translation and the usage of this word, you'll see that the early English translations after Tyndale's used Easter much more frequently as well. Because every time you'll find the word Passover in the New Testament, Tyndale was... Every, every time you use the word, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what I just said, so I'll restate it. Every time you see the word Passover in the King James Bible in the New Testament, Tyndale had that as Easter. And you'll even see like, like in, um, oh, what's the reference? Like 1 Corinthians, it says um, Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. He called him the Easter lamb. Okay? And all throughout, basically, it boils down to this. Easter is essentially a synonym for Passover. They mean exactly the same thing. Okay, so these translations are using the word Easter, or whether you're using the word Passover, it's the same exact event, it's the same exact thing. The slight difference, and this is why, what I think is amazing in the King James Bible, is just that the, um, the slight difference is, why is it only used one time here? Because you see, over the years, the different translations that came out after Tyndale, you know, you have the Bishop's Bible, Geneva Bible, you have all these different Bibles that came out. They slowly started replacing... Easter with Passover in the New Testament. And one reason for this is because, okay, when he first comes out with a translation, that word has to be accepted. 
I mean, he just created the word, he invented it, right? So it needs to kind of be accepted by believers. People need to be able to read it and say, yes, you know, that's a valid, that's a valid translation. That works. So as it gained popularity, as people accepted it and said, you know what, this is a good word, they started using it more and more in the New Testament. And so why is it only retained then one time in the King James Bible? If Passover is such a great word, and it is. And this is kind of what blew me away, is that every other New Testament usage refers to the Old Testament Passover. So every time, like in the book of Matthew, in the book of Mark, in the book of Luke, in the book of John, when you see the word Passover in the King James Bible, it's always referring to the, you know, it was prior to Christ's resurrection. In all the four Gospels, I mean, Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead, like at the very end of all the, all the Gospels, right? I mean, the last few chapters is when you read about Jesus Christ's death and his resurrection in the Gospels. All the mentions of, of the Passover were prior to that. Or, the only other thing is that if it was in, like, 1 Corinthians or in, in, in any other place in the Bible, like the book of Acts, when you see the word Passover, it's still referring to the Old Testament. But what we have here in the, in the context of Acts chapter 12 is that we see that, that this is specific. I mean, this, is, this event took place definitely after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because Peter was arrested and Herod said he intended after Easter to let go. So that word Easter was retained in this place because it's referring to the event that specifically is celebrated after Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. All the other references are talking about the Passover of the Old Testament. This is talking about Easter of the, of the New Testament. Now, the translation, if you, were, if, you were to, if you were to flip them, again, I believe they're synonyms. I mean, it's referring essentially to the same event, but there's that one just, just little, one little nuance, I guess you can say, of the word, where, where it's associated, that just that word is associated with the resurrection of Christ as opposed to the Passover, which is why I believe that the translators of the King James Bible left that in place here. And it's also why I believe in, um, in Acts 12, in verse number 3, you know, Luke was, the, was the, the human instrument that wrote down the book of Acts. It says, he just put that in parentheses, then were the days of unleavened bread. Okay. And then it says, after Easter. And this is already associating the days of unleavened bread with Easter. Now, there's another argument that people will make. And I just want to point this out to you because, as I mentioned, Easter, Passover, they're synonyms. But see, now some people are going to argue that the Passover only refers to one day, whereas Easter is a period of time. Whereas Easter is that, that, that Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because they'll say, they'll look at this and they'll say, okay, well, yeah, he pointed out that then were the days of unleavened bread, which meant that it was, you know, sometime after the Passover where they actually killed the lamb on the 14th day. So they're saying this happened at some point between the 15th and 21st day of the month. And the problem with that is that if you just say, well, Easter is referring to a period of time, that's not true. And, uh, well, it's not true that it would be only Easter referring to that period of time because the way you can prove this false, there's two places in the Bible that I'm going to refer to. You don't have to turn it. If you want to, you can turn it. I'm going to go to Ezekiel 45 and Luke 22 that refer to the Passover as not just one day. The Passover is not just that one day. In Ezekiel 45, 21, the Bible says, In the first month, in the 14th day of the month, ye shall have the Passover. Then it says, Come, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. So there it's referring to, okay, the 14th day of the month, you have the Passover, but the Passover is a feast of seven days. And... The feast of in, in Luke 22, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. You can't get much more clear than that. Right? The Bible is defining the feast of unleavened bread as the Passover. So what we see here is that, you know, I, I, the reason why I'm saying this is because people will try to attack the King James Bible as being inerrant. They'll try to say, no, no, this is wrong. And, I, and it's amazing to me how people just love to correct the translators of the King James Bible, people who don't know anything about Greek, about Hebrew, or even about the history of the Bibles themselves, just in the English language. I mean, just looking at the history, you can see all of the old, older versions were used in Easter for a very good reason. 
And it makes sense. This is not just this is not just some oversight. You know, these people, these men that were involved with translating the King James Bible, they weren't just that reckless and that careless that they just, oh, oops, we just left Easter in there by accident. There's no way. There's no way. You look at the credentials of the men that translated the King James Bible, and it will amaze you. It will astound you the intelligence and the integrity and the education that these men have. They're nothing like what people today have. Nothing. They were not just your average Layman, they were not even just your average pastor or anything like that. These people were linguists. I mean, there was one guy that was fluent in like 15 languages. 15! Like all of the languages, of like the European languages, just completely fluent at all. I mean, that's, that's astounding to me. It's amazing if you find someone who's like got three languages or even two. A two isn't common, but you know, you have people who grew up in Spanish, speaking homes. They speak Spanish and English just fine. But like, that's just based on where they grew up and, and where they're coming from. These guys were, were, were scholars and students of language and of church history and of all these different things. And they came together and, and they agreed on, on the words that came down. And see, God was with them. And, there's, and I'm not going to get too much into this, but it's just a precursor. If, if it interests you, see, this blew me away when I saw this, how, how awesome it is, how perfect it is. Because you, you always wonder, like, why is that left in one place? Oh, this is the only verse in the entire Bible that, that uses that word Easter. And people will attack it. And, and a lot of times people will attack it because it's the only place. Normally with words and with, with um, things in the Bible, you'll see it used at least more than once. And they kind of build, like back each other up, the do, like doctrines. And you should always be looking for doctrines to, to build off each other. But um, you know, people will point to this and just say no. And, and all it is is if, if you just actually study and just look, look at the history of the Bibles, look at where the stuff came from, and, and understand why it was done that way. You can, it's easy to see. And even just using the own Bible definitions, you can see, even just based off of that, that part in parentheses, then were the days of unleavened bread, that would be meaningless to put that in there unless it was associating Easter with the days of unleavened bread. Right? I mean, why, why else would you need that there? Because everybody knows what the Passover is. But they added it anyway. So get back to Exodus chapter 12. And I'm going to do a lot, of, a much longer sermon on Easter when Easter actually comes up. But for now, let's go back to Acts chapter 12. I just want to take up quite a bit of time showing you that because it's real interesting. This is the only place, the only time we're going to, um, in our Bible study, that we're going to be able to preach on that because it's the only place that it occurs. So let's continue on reading in verse number 5. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Rise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Now I read the whole, the whole part of this, but basically what happens is, Okay, you have the church, have, and we're going to get to this in a minute. The church is praying without ceasing. They're praying for Peter. Peter, James just got killed, right? James was killed with the sword. Now Peter's arrested, and, and the people in the church are rightfully, I mean, they're kind of freaked out. They're just like, oh, man, you know, we, we got to pray for Peter. We got, you know, we got to pray that God's going to step in and save him. And so what happens is Peter, he's sleeping in his prison cell. He's literally between two soldiers bound with two chains. He's got two chains. He's bound with the chains. He's right in between these soldiers. They were ordered to keep him fast, to hold him in that prison, and to secure him. And what happens is the angel of the Lord goes, he's like, hey, get up. You know, like, smacks him on the side, like, get up. And there's a light in the cell. Peter gets up. You know, he puts his clothes on. His shackles are just, just come off of his hands. And the angel starts leading him out of the prison. And the doors are just opening up to him, the prison doors. The guards are still sleeping. You know, they're just, they're just walking through. You know, walking through basically like the middle of prison, probably one of the one of the most secure places, and they're just they're just making their way, just walking out. And then he gets to the to the big broad iron gates, the big front door of the prison, the big front gates. It just opens right up onto him, and and he leads him out. And then the angel leaves. After a couple of streets, he's just he's just gone. So like this whole time, Peter's just thinking he's dreaming. He's thinking he's seeing a vision, right? I mean, he's, right, he's just thinking, like, oh, okay, well, this is cool, but, you know, not really thinking he's, you know, he's actually, this is actually happening. It's surreal. I mean, it, it would be surreal. Think about it. Like, 
Like there's this angel here, your shackles fall off your hands, the guards are just sleeping, all the doors are opening up. It sounds like a dream. It doesn't sound like reality. But with God, all things are possible. And this is why I would point out is that I believe that re one of the reasons why this happened is because prayer was made without ceasing of the church to God for Peter. They were praying and praying and praying. They didn't stop. And anyone who's prayed knows it's not that easy to just continually pray. I mean, you pray a little bit and you're done. No, they, they all got together. There was a big group of them. They met at a house and they just, they just kept praying. Like, Man, we're going to pray for Peter. We're going to pray that God delivers him. And amen, God is able to deliver anybody out of the worst situation. He's facing death. He thinks that he's going to be just killed. But because of prayer, the power of prayer, God releases God freedom. God just, just told a miracle. It doesn't matter how locked up you are. It doesn't matter who's watching you. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. God is capable to get you out of any tribulation, out of any trouble, out of any situation that you're in. But you have to have faith. You have to just pray um, faithfully. James chapter 5, if you would please turn there. Now, I'm not going to go over this too much, but we went over this when I preached an entire sermon on prayer and how to pray and the power of prayer and how good it is. But James chapter 5, great chapter to learn about prayer. It really lays it out. James chapter 5, right near the end of the Bible, right after the book of Hebrews, you have the book of James. James chapter number 5, look at verse number 13 of James chapter 5. The Bible reads, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Now, I would say Peter was afflicted. He was in persecution. He was in bonds. He says, let him pray. Is any married? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Again, I can't stress prayer enough. God, God is willing to perform miracles, but he wants to hear from you. He wants you to ask him. Ask and you shall receive. You ask God and he'll give it to you, but he needs you to ask him. He's not going to perform the miracles if you're not talking to him, if you're not asking him, if you're not going to him, if you're not humble, if you're not just relying on God and asking, God, please help me with this. I have this problem. I need your help. We need to be humble. We can't just deal with everything all on our own. We need to go to God. The Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's a promise. Verse number 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Again, I went over that during our sermon in about prayer. How, I mean, he, he prayed that it wouldn't rain. Wouldn't rain on the earth. For three years it didn't rain. Because of his prayer. And then because of his prayer, it rained again. God listened to him. God hearkened to him. God wants to do miracles. God wants to do miracles today. We need to have the faith. We need to be going to God. We need to be thinking about God, have him first in our lives, and rely on him and just go to him and go to him in prayer. And don't just go to him in a quick one-minute prayer to say, Dear God, I just need help with this situation. Okay, thank you. Amen. In Jesus' name. That's not what he's looking for. He wants you to pray earnestly. He wants you to pray fervently. He wants to hear from you and really rely on him without ceasing like this church did for Peter. When you know someone's in trouble, especially when you know someone's in trouble, when you know someone's going through an extremely difficult time, hey, that's the time to get on your knees. That's the time to start fasting. And that's the time to really just up your prayer and really pray without ceasing. Those are the times you need to do it the most. Just as when Peter was in prison. Hey, you don't know how long he has to even survive. You better get down on your knees and start praying to God that God will deliver. And God answered their prayer and he did it. Amen. Let's go back to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, verse number 11. This is when Peter realizes, all through up, up until verse 11, it was just him being led out by the angel. Look at verse number 11. It says, and when Peter was coming to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And he's saying, Okay, like he's, he kind of, you know, rubbed his eyes, just like, Whoa, what just happened? Like, 
I'm really out. Like, I'm really not in jail anymore. This is, you know, this is great glory to God. And that God had delivered him. And he knew, obviously, that the Lord had sent his angel. It was not a question in his mind. Let's continue reading verse number 12. The Bible says that when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John. So now he's going out to his friend's house. I mean, he's going to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together, again, praying. That's where they were gathered together. They were there praying. They were still praying for Peter because they didn't know. I mean, they had no idea. It's been released. They're there praying. They're doing a vigil. You know, they're praying probably all night. I mean, he's in the middle of the night. He was sleeping between the guards. The guards were asleep. He gets let out, but they're up praying. They're not, they didn't say, it's late. They say, I'm tired. I got to work tomorrow. I can't, I can't do this. I know Peter's in trouble, but God will take care of him. I'm just going to go to sleep and get my beauty sleep. That's not what they did. They stayed up praying. They stayed up praying for him late into the night, and they probably would have stayed up all night for him praying. That's the type of love that we ought to have for other people, that when they're going through some really hard times, that you can stay up, do something to stay up all night and pray for that person. God will hear you. Look at verse number 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. So he's out there knocking. Rhoda comes. And, and this, is, <laughs> this is always really funny. I mean... And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So, like, she just hears Peter's like, hello, you know, like, let me in, it's Peter. And, and she hears his voice, and she's just like, oh, it's Peter. And she just, like, runs the other way. Instead of, like, opening up the door to let him in, she's just like, oh, it's Peter. And she runs back and just tells everyone, hey, look, Peter's outside. And they're just like, no, it's not. They're like, it's his angel. You know, Peter's not there. But then it says in verse 16, it says, but Peter continued knocking. So Peter's just out there, just like, uh, Hello, are you guys going to let me in? You know, like they're all having this, this event going on inside and they're doubting and everything else. Peter's still knocking at the door. It says, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They're amazed. They're just like, wow. Now, they shouldn't have even been amazed. I can understand how they're amazed. I, I really can. Um, but we shouldn't be. When God steps in and does miraculous events, it shouldn't even necessarily amaze us. Now, it's great and it is isn't. I mean, God's, God's work is astonishing and is amazing. Amen. But it also says that we should pray just expecting and knowing that our prayers are going to be answered too. And I'm not just saying they were in the wrong here. Like I said, I, mean, I understand it. This is a big miracle. And, I, and I'm always, right or wrong, I'm always amazed when I see God step in and he's answering my prayers and just doing all kinds of great things in my life. It's just, it's humbling. It's amazing. And it just truly shows how powerful God is. And, um, and that's, you know, they're astonished. Like, Man, Peter's here. It says in verse 17, but he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace. He's like, okay, be quiet now. Declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. So, so he tells them, he tells them the whole story, and he's like, Okay, go look, go tell James. Go tell the other, go tell the other brethren. He's like, now this isn't James the brother of John, right? Because James the brother of John's dead. This would be James the Lord's brother. Okay? And um, the Lord Jesus Christ, his physical brother in the flesh. He um, he said, Okay, go look, tell James. And he departed, he went into another place, so he's getting out of there. Okay, he was not commanded. As in times past, in, the, in, in previous chapters of the book of Acts, you know, they were commanded, okay, now go back and preach in the temple. This wasn't, Peter wasn't commanded to go and do that again. You know, Herod was after him. But then we see what happens to, um, well, first, let's continue reading here, okay. Uh, where are we at? Verse number, verse number 18. Okay, now we see, now that we see the result of what happens after Peter, get, you know, after the jail break, after God breaks him out of jail. Verse 18, now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. So these guys, okay, it's morning, you know, they wake up or whatever, and they're just looking around and it's like, where's Peter? You know, I mean, this guy was chained between two soldiers. He was, he was locked up in the cell. Like, where did he go? It's not like you've gotten very far. I mean, so there, there's no small stir. I'm sure they're turning things over, trying to find like what in the world happened to Peter. Look at verse number 19. It says, And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, so Herod calls for him. He says, Okay, bring me Peter now. Right? When Herod sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. So now when it says examine there, it doesn't say he was looking at them closely. That's not, that's not what it means by examine. He examined them. What he probably ended up doing was beating them. Because how in the world can... can this guy escaped. Can this prisoner escape while you're on duty? Right? It's your job. And I'm sure he's again, you're lying. 
Because they'll just be like, I don't, I don't know what happened to him. He was there, then he wasn't there. I don't know what happened. So Herod's examining him. He's saying, no, you're going to tell me what happened. And then he just puts him to death. And turn, if you would, real quick. It's the last place we're going to turn, other than Acts 12. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 16. Because now we're going to see a similar story and, um, and get a little bit of understanding. Acts 16. Acts 16 is a great soul winning passage. I use this probably every single time. Every single time I have a chance to give the person the gospel, even if I don't have a chance to like, actually give them the gospel, this is one of the main verses that I try to use every single time I go soul winning because it's so great. Acts chapter 16. Let's start reading in verse number 25. The Bible says that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. Again, you see the prayer. Paul and Silas are in jail. Okay? It says, and they prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So they're in jail. They're singing praises. They're praying unto God. They're just, I mean, they're joyful in prison, right? I mean, they're, they're praying to God. They're singing praises to God. Prisoners hear this, and then it says in verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. So very similar situation, except instead of just happening to one person like it did to Peter, now it's everybody. I mean, this, this isn't even just Paul and Silas. This is just like all the prison doors are open up and everybody's bands are loosed. Everybody's. And then in verse 27, it says, And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep. So again, another prison guard asleep. I don't know why it's so hard for him to say awake, but um, we see here another prison guard asleep. And seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. So this guy's about to kill himself. Now, a lot of times people will use the story in souling, but they don't even understand. Like, why would you know? People ask, like, why would the guy try to kill himself? Like, why is he kill himself? Well, it's because of what happened in Acts chapter twelve. Because the prison guards. I mean, these prison guards know what's going on. That they, they, they knew what happened with Peter. They knew that those those prison guards that were that were charged to to be responsible for watching over Peter. He knew that they got examined, which means they probably got tortured. And then they got put to death. So this guy's like, I mean, he sees all the prison doors open. He's just like, I'm not even going to deal with this. And he was about to kill himself. Because he didn't want to go through what those other prison guards went through, being called before air. Because why would he expect anything different to happen to him? He would have no explanation. This is just, I mean, this is just craziness, right? I mean, all these doors are just open. And he thought all the prisoners were gone, but they weren't. And that's where it says in verse 28, But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And then we go into the famous um, passages where he says, Then he called for light, came, sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, What must I do to be saved? Right? And they said, Believe our Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in the house. <laughs> Great story. Flip back to Acts chapter 12 here. I just wanted to point that out because people ask me, I've had people ask me that question before. I'm so angry. Because sometimes I'll go a little bit more in depth in that story than other times. It just, just depends on what, you know, who I'm talking to and how it's going. But, um, People ask, like, why was he going to kill himself? Well, it's because of what happened here in, in, in Acts 12. But let's, um, let's continue reading here. Let's jump down to verse number 21. Or verse number 20. It says, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made blasts to the king's chamberlain, their friend desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration on them. He made a speech. That's what an oration is. He's given a speech, this, you know, the State of the Union or whatever, right? And he's, he's pontificating, he's giving his speech, and then look what happens. It says in verse 22, and the people gave a shout, saying, it is the voice of a god and not of a man. Now that's wicked. So this guy's, I mean, this guy here, he's up there, and he's, 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 he's really speaking wonderful words, apparently, whatever, to these people, they love him. I mean, he just killed James with the sword. These people are eating it up, and they're just like, this is this is just coming directly from God. That's not even a man talking to us. And he ate up that glory. And because he did that, it says in verse 23, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. And we could take this as an admonition for ourselves, okay? One day you might have people that'll start praising you a little bit, a lot too much, right? I mean, like this, this is extremely too much saying, hey, this is the voice of a God and not of a man. You better not let yourself get puffed up. Do not, because God will abase you. God will bring you low and God might even just kill you. We need to give God the credit. Hey, and look, that's what he did to Ananias and Sapphira, is it not? They came when they sold their possession and brought it before God, right? 
They brought their money, but they kept back part of it, which shows their heart wasn't right. They were doing it for show to say, oh yeah, we sold this, here's all the money. That's why they were doing it. They were doing it to be lifted up. They were doing it to receive glory unto themselves. And what did God do? They fell over dead. Instantly. The same way that Herod, Herod should have said, uh, no, I'm not a God. I'm just a man. Give God the credit. Give God the glory. If I'm such a great speaker, hey, glory to God. If I'm such a great preacher, hey, glory to God. If I go out and there's a bunch of souls getting saved, hey, glory to God. It's not me. It's not you. It's God. God deserves all the credit and all the glory. And if we don't have that humble attitude, it's going to make God angry. And you definitely don't want God's wrath on you. And, I mean, he might just extinguish your life. And just say, that's it. I've had enough. So let's take that as an admonition. We're almost done here. Let's, let's uh, finish up. It says in verse 24, it says, But the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them God, whose name was Mark. So even though all this persecution is going on, even though Herod is just, I mean, he's putting people to death, you know, Peter's put in prison, there's all this stuff, it still says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. And it's because there were people not willing to back down. Even in the face of persecution, they stayed strong. They kept their faith in God. They continued to pray. They continued to do the things that they were supposed to do. They continued to preach the gospel, even when it became difficult, even when they were, they were risking their own lives to do it. They did it anyways, and because of that, God blessed it, and the word of God grew and multiplied. It's, it reminds me of the, the children of Israel in Egypt, right? The Egyptians were trying to do everything that they could to just keep them in bondage, to keep them down, and to just, you know, they have to kill their children, they have to do all this stuff because they did, they were, they were physically multiplying, and, and God was multiplying them, and they, and they were outnumbering the Egyptians. But they couldn't stop them. They couldn't stop them, and ultimately... God stepped in, right? You have the prayer of Moses, prayer of Aaron, and you have God showing his mighty power from, even from just two people that were willing, to, even just one person willing to just stand and, and, just, and just be sold out for God and just do what it was that he had for him to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for a perfect Bible. God, I thank you. I thank you that... Um, I don't have to be ashamed of, of saying that, no, I believe that, that your word is perfect and there are no errors in it. And that, and that you know, these aren't mistakes that were made by, by the people that you use to preserve your word as you promised to preserve them, preserve them dear God. And um, that you've done so many wonderful things when your word grew and multiplied, as it says in Acts chapter 12, and it continues until this day. Lord, I pray that you would please bless our church. I pray that you please help us to retain humble attitudes. Lord, to always be giving you the, the credit and honor. And one way that we can do that, dear Lord, is by making sure that we spend enough time in prayer. Lord, myself, as much or more than everybody else, dear God, help me to, to understand and to make, my, make the time that's required and that's necessary to really devote time for prayer because it is powerful, dear Lord, and we need you and we need to rely on you and we need to go to you in prayer, dear God, and not be flippant about it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.